And the truth will set us free. Okay, so last time we left uh, off uh, finishing the book nine, and uh, it was the moment when uh, Dmitri, uh, not literally through the judgments at the toll booths, uh, you know, sort of representing the judgment of the soul after uh, death, and then <coughs> now. He is ready to go through uh, the suffering uh, in order to be reborn in Christ. And, uh, you know, I, uh, although we finished the book last time, uh, I missed one uh, uh, quote that kind of puts it all together. Uh, it's on page uh, 509. It's in chapter 9, book 9. Uh, can I ask uh, Father John to read it? Sure, I'll read it. Yeah. I don't mind. All right. I've progressed in promising to reform, and every day I've done the same vile things. I understand now that for men, for men such as I, a blow is needed, a blow of fate, to catch them as with a noose and bind them by an external force. Never, never would I have risen by myself. But the thunder has struck. I accept the torment of accusation and of my disgrace before all. I want to suffer and be purified by suffering. I accept punishment not because I killed him, but because I wanted to kill him and might well have killed him. That's that's like right out of St. Simeon the New Theologian. And, uh, well, I mean... Is, that is orthodox. That is extremely orthodox. And uh, so, I mean, on the one maybe to you as well, where, you know, you, th you think that you will be able by your own uh, efforts to, you know, make yourself better and stop doing whatever things that, you know, you're supposed to stop doing, but time after time you fail. And then, so the idea here with Dostoevsky is that a person needs to fall all the way to like the very very bottom sort of like I guess same thing that they do in the whatever the 12 step program or you know with, uh, with people with addictions that un until you reach the very bottom there isn't really any uh, chance for you to start recovering and start building back up that's one thing but also here uh, uh, why it Father John, I think, said that this is a hundred percent orthodox because here he is uh, rephrasing the uh, the essence of Christ's teachings. Where at the end he said that I accept the punishment not because I killed him, meaning his father, but because I wanted to kill him and might well have killed him. So here. We have the, as we talked many times, that for Dostoevsky is important to show the essence of Christianity and, and, you know, get away of all the pagan influence. And the essence is here that it's not, uh, it's not just the actions that you do that matter, but it's the internal state uh, that you are in when you, uh, even if, you know, you, he didn't actually go ahead and kill him, but he is nonetheless guilty for having those thoughts, being angry at his father to the point where, uh, you know, he was ready uh, to do it. But Christ said that, you know, it's, whether you do it or not, it's even if you think about doing it, you've done it. And that's uh, with, um, and then there was the, the apostles said, well, then who can be saved? You know, it's, it's possible with Christ. It's not possible in uh, which is what Dimitri came to. Yeah, exactly. So he's saying, uh, on my, by myself, you know, I give up. You know, I'm no longer uh, even, you know, hoping and thinking that I can do it myself. And this is why he now has to go to Siberia and and be uh, actually suffer to the end. Why it is important 
at the end today uh, but <coughs> before we actually move to uh, book 10 which is about the boys uh, this will be a new thing and uh, I guess this is the point where we can now talk about it we have to uh, clear away and, 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 and uh, find out what's the essence of Karamazov is because after all th this is the title of the book and it's uh, you know it's no coincidence that they are made the protagonists right so there must be given you know all these main th themes in the book that are about Christianity and and how to live in Christ there must be something in them that is essential not just in one of them but you know something that makes them brothers some common trait that, that they supposed to have and most likely they inherited it from their father that you know is is very important <coughs> and many people actually uh, when they try to uh, discern or analyze what's the essence of Karamazov mostly look at the first half of the book and we have uh, numerous instances there uh, where it's actually named but I think it's a wrong approach I'll, I'll explain later because people like Rakitin who is representing the devil there tells to Alexei uh, you know when he is like Karamazov so he's kind of saying that this is the essence of Karamazov then also when Alexei and Dmitri are having this confession experience with each other it also come up, comes up that this is you know this sort of lust or or sensuality and many you know scholars kind of support this view saying that this is the essence and this is something that all Karamazovs uh, share and you know this is what makes them uh, who they are <coughs> but again if you then look back at the grand sort of purpose of the book you know to uh, to promote Christianity to uh, show us the essence of Christianity and this is what makes the protagonists sort of who they are it doesn't so you know it doesn't match with each other and <coughs> it's uh, it's also I think is uh, uh, is inconsistent with Dostoevsky's view of the human soul that this is the, the human the essence of being human is this having this internal con you know conflict internal contradiction between light light and darkness and uh, so something like that I think is just you know if you just say that the essence of being Karamazov is just you know go after women then I think it's uh, it's a bad idea so I'm kind of want to have some sort of not a discussion but if people have their own views on what is the essence of being Karamazov yes Father John uh, well I, I think one the thing that I feel about Karamazov is that when you look at the family as a whole even Sner's father who is like associated you know yeah he is half sort half, of right um, that they're very passionate people and uh, they're very passionate. The father obviously was passionate toward women and you know wine, women's song, and money. You know, and, and gaining money. And he wouldn't. He didn't really care what what it what in the way. And uh, and you know, for Ivan, for all that he is, he's passionate in his own way for this sort of atheistic kind of like. Um, uh, he's pa anyway, passionate is one of the things mm -hmm. that you could say about them. So then you see through the book, you see how um, the elder plays such a role because he doesn't condemn any of them, mm -hmm. actually. He never condemns them. Like others would say, so people from the outside look at him and say, oh yeah, they're just that way. But he never condemns them because he always sees them that passion. He even bowed to one of them, right? Right. To the, his future suffering. That passion can be gone. You can see, you just see the transformation of that passion as it kind of climbs higher and higher and it comes to resurrection and that sense of resurrection. I know that's what I think. Well, you next. What I got from, what I was thinking about throughout the whole book 
book was kind of that uh, the Karamazov name has this passion associated with it, but that the three sons, and well, I never really thought of Smirnikov that much, but it might apply in the same way, but it seems like they have the same thing, it's just that they cope with it in different ways, so it's like have the same, the same thing, the same what, what, what the same thing that they have that they have to cope with? I think, like, um, women and... So you would be more a uh, traditional view. Yeah, okay. yeah. Women, but also, not so much money, but like, like their, their influence on, on the world. Yeah. Well, well, Ivan would be uh, the one. How do you explain Alexei? Well, they all seem to desire uh, like a place in the world, or like an impact on the world. Like that's, that really that's significant. And that Alexei's, I saw that as kind of a shifting, because originally I think I, I saw him as kind of, well, wanting nothing to do mm -hmm. with the world, right? So like, the opposite kind of approach as his way of dealing mm -hmm. with that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then, like, Ivan was, like, ending his life type of thing. So it's both were kind of the same thing, where they're kind of trying to mm -hmm. put the tick ticket Okay. Back, give the ticket back, or whatever, right? right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're more <laughs> like, a, like, m like most of the people analyzing the yeah. book, I yeah. think, would agree with you. You want to okay. say? So, I have not read the book for, for a long time. Okay. <laughs> I have not read the book. Um, but I've heard a lot of people talk about the book in my life, and I also have uh -huh. a the class. Uh, a lot of what the book seems to be about is the transformation of uh, going to seeing the three types of emotions and the very first, um, and learning to find the role in not only his own instructor, but also in the world. And a lot of it is about the acceptance of uh, having free will. Uh -huh. is good uh, I, I, it's just the father's Jones the only one that I could formulate in, in one word that's why I put it up it, it doesn't mean that his is better than anybody else I feel about uh, <coughs> Alexei mm -hmm. that he his passion is toward the Sima, mm -hmm. the Sima in other words toward the goodness mm -hmm. toward the uh, chestnut uh, honesty honesty uh, etc. Okay. Well, I mean, you have to understand that it's not ju just don't take my word, but it has to be something really good and something really important because if you go through all the book and then there you are on the last page reading the last line. Anybody remember what it says? It says, Hooray for Karamazov. So, the last line, the last sentence in, in the book is the praise for whatever the essence of Karamazov is. So it has to be some, something praiseworthy. And I mean, my humble opinion is uh, more closer to uh, Father John, I would say, than to anybody else. But I, I'll try to actually go and, and, and prove uh, what I think is what w uh, first to explain and then prove why I think it's right. What's the essence uh, of Karamazov? And it's actually w more gradually revealed in the second half of the book. So I think the first one is sort of a setup to how the world sort of understands them and misunderstands them. So anyway, uh, uh, still staying on. Uh, uh, book 9, it's uh, page 471, when it's uh, during those torments that uh, 
Dmitry had to go through. Uh, so at the at the uh, end of the book, he is sort of going telling to the investigators, you know, that they must to be must believe him. Why? Because you know he is saying here what you see here are the noblest impulses of the soul so it's it's close to the word passion he calls them impulses oh, yep impulses of the soul and just a uh, couple of, uh, well not couple, 20 pages later he has something to contrast it with what, what the, to explain what he means and what it's opposite to so it's uh, I'll say it's okay, so let's go to 492 and here what he says <coughs> why basically why he, he is explaining to them why he thinks that the worst thing that he did was to hide away half of the money that he got from Katerina so he spends one half we actually had a d discussion about it last time he spends half of the money and then he hides another half away sort of to uh, in case his lover says yes let's run away so then he has some funds to uh, support them going forward but what he says here, <coughs> and why it's bad, he's trying to explain to them. Uh, I set it aside out of baseness. That is out of calculation. Because calculation in this case is baseness. So what he is contrasting is impulses against calculation. And <coughs> the interrogators, and this is uh, this this view to say that you know impulses are better, uh, you know, must prevail against calculations. You know, in in our age and at his age, the same. Most of the people would say no, that's wrong. That has to be otherwise. And the one of the interrogators replies to him on the next page. Well, in my opinion, it's even sensible and moral that you restrained yourself and didn't squander it all. So the interrogator is telling him those calculations that you did when you hid the money, it's actually moral. You know, it's good. It's your impulses that, you know, got, got, got you uh, in trouble. <coughs> so... <coughs> Uh, and you know, in, I don't know about our age, but at least then it was true. So, uh, and in order to finish this, uh, I think we talked about it on the first meeting or on the second uh, about Plato and his idea of his view on the human soul. That it has three parts. I'll call it three parts soul. Uh, and I mentioned it then uh, that you know the church fathers or Orthodox church fathers in general uh, agree with sort of the Plato's view of how the human soul you know what the, the essence of the human soul at least that's what I've read in the Philokalia and, and the notes to it well anyway just to remind you according to Plato there are three parts you know our human souls consist of three parts first is reason second are like the appetites and three is well it's a uh, it's a Greek word that you know I translated as spirit you could translate it as passion too, you know, it's in Greek is thumos. And uh, I will explain the difference. Basically, the reason is, you know, 
the calculations, the 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 enlightenment, the the, re the you know the log logisticon, right? So the everything associated with logos, the appetite is what we share with animals. You know that hunger, thirst, or the troops, and they can support either one or another. You know when you are indignant at your own shortcomings. You know say well. You want, like during the land, you know, you want to grab that steak, and, but inside yourself, you, you tell yourself, oh, you wretched soul, you shouldn't, you know, th this is like you, you use passions to support the reason to stay away from your appetitive part. But on the other hand, it can be also on the side of the appetites, where you're like, Oh, forget that reason, like, you know, it's Hume, Hume uh, that's another, like, a Western philosopher, he would say that in really the reason is just the slave of, of the appetites, because, you know, you really go after your desires, and then the reason sort of justifies all the, uh, why you actually had to do it, and one day why there was no choice, and why it was the right course of action. So anyway, this is, uh, this is the part basically which can uh, it's you know be used either for good or for bad so like the rage you can direct the rage against somebody and that would be bad but you could also direct that rage internally against something in, against your own scenes and really be passionate about you know fighting your own sins, not fighting the sins in somebody else, but inside of yourself. So that way, this spirit, you know, can be both sort of amb ambivalent, depending on whether it protects the reason or protects the appetites. And of course, in Plato, that would be the main, and that's kind of the Western world went with Plato to say, well, the main thing is the reason, and these two just have to be controlled and be on the side of the reason. Mm -hmm. And that's, in terms of the book, would be like everybody, like a normal person to say, yeah, calculations. And based on calculations, that's how we need to act. Whereas Mitri is saying that, you know, the noblest part are the impulses of the soul. And what he means, I think, is this, third part and we'll see on the uh, in the book 11 how basically Ivan is this western uh, western guy who would say that oh yeah remember the, throughout the book he associates himself just with the reason and he's like he will try to get rid of the spirit and, and the appetite and will actually fail because of that here Dmitri is saying this is this is what is if anything is going to save me is you know staying with my good impulses and trying to fight my uh, bad ones and basically to finish all of this i think this is the essence of being karamazov is and that's why it's praised at the end that you know you don't go the western way and if you just say all all you need is the reason you know you're going to be like van but and he, he will have a chance to act on him. And then, well, I will reveal it. The only good thing Ivan did throughout the whole book is when he didn't listen to the reason and he went with his impulses and he did one good thing in the book. Every time else, he was with the reason and, and he was, no, no. And he, and he was doing the bad, the bad things. Yes, Father John. Well, well just on a modern level, I was gonna say that People who have addictions, um, they give in. They're, they're totally living in their appetite. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the spirit. That they really go after that. They become very creative and very. I mean, they develop a whole affair with it, and they don't use reason. But then, when they try to get without God, <coughs> they try to use reason to stop drinking and to stop using and to stop doing. So then they become what they call in the business a dry drunk. Uh, because they're not drinking, but they're also not really doing anything about it. They're just staying in stasis. 
until a time will come up and they will drink again and they will just be ten times worse than they were before. Mm -hmm. So it's like it takes kind of a combination of the three to work together. You know, so that's the idea. Yes. Yes. So again, just to reiterate, the essence of being Karmazov is having this mm -hmm. spirit part well, I mean, support the reason, but actually being enlightened by God and being directed, you know, within the framework of Christianity and that being your driving force, not not the reason, well, and obviously not, not the apparent force. He's describing, you know, him, he says, moreover, there were, uh, and he couldn't understand, there were contradictions. He was proud, but devoted to me like, it's sla like a slave. Devoted to me like a slave, yet suddenly his eyes would flash and he wouldn't even want to agree with me. He'd argue, beat on the wall. So he couldn't, he thought, you know, this is something strange. How come, you know, it's not, you know, he couldn't understand that humans can have conflicting uh, motivation and, and conflicting interests at, at the same time. Because he says, I had in mind to discipline his character, to shape him up to create a person, you know, so he thought by, uh, you know, uh, conditioning, you can just do that, you know, people would be like dogs, you just train them, and because he's actually really good at training dogs, so, so, so uh, but then, uh, but then they would lack the essence of humanity, I think, you know, whoever gets to that stage, I don't think you can. Let me get a something to wipe it off with. In being influenced, right? He is very eloquent for them and pretending to be a priest. Another thing he did, he taught this uh, boy to uh, put needles in dog's food and then throw it to the dogs so that they swallow it and, and, and suffer and things like that. <coughs> he has to do the same thing and he sort of uh, died because, because of his illness. Um, uh, one last thing on this book is uh, how like the, the similarity between uh, what Alexei was able to perform the miracle when he was able to perform the miracle with Grushenko saving her from this uh, so he is doing the same thing with Kolya that it's sort of so that you don't miss he uses pretty much the same conversation being inserted even between the different people so that you sort of hear it and oh I you know I've seen it already and this is this is what's this is what uh, what's happening uh, and I mean I have kind of do uh, people are okay if we go on for another 15 minutes or so certainly I know but you know it's just I don't want to this is uh, going to be important stuff so I don't want like people to go it over their heads if they're tired or rather do it next time well, anyway, I think this is all I wanted to uh, say about the book uh, Na Pen, and now we can go to another very important theme, which will be developed in book 11 about Ivan. And again, uh, you have to notice it by now, I've been sort of highlighting those things. What is the title of the book about Alexei? Alyosha. Uh -huh. How the book Alyosha. itself is yeah. titled. The title of the book about Dmitri is Mitya. All those like endearing versions of the name mm -hmm. saying that, you know, we'll get this uh, intimate close account of them. What's mm -hmm. the title of the book about Ivan? Ivan? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to guess. I mean, you have a book. I, I, well, I, mean, I don't <laughs> you, remember you that. Can, uh, you can open <laughs> it up and just read it. Hold on. 
it uses very formal version of the name. It's not just Ivan, but it's Ivan, Ivan. son of Theodore. Right? So, I mean, right, right there you already see, you know, there's something wrong with his brother. So even in his book where, you know, this is all dedicated to him, you know, he has a very different version of the name being used that, you know, again, as you will see, the only entity that has intimate relationship with him will be the devil himself, if, if, if you read it. Uh, well, anyway, that's 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 a start. Just just about the title, <coughs> and now also, I want you to recall when how Ivan and Alexei departed after the end of the Grand Inquisitor. That last paragraph when Ivan started to walk off. Remember what we talked about? What he was doing? How he looked like? That his one shoulder was and he was kind of dragging one mm -hmm. foot and what that represented <coughs> I do remember yeah he was carrying a cross I mean not literally but his physical appearance yeah. was such that he had something on his shoulder and he was you know walking in a way that on one of his shoulders was a cross and and we talked about and then it says in the next it said in the next sentence that Alex, you remember that yesterday, Brother Dmitri walked the same way when 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 they they departed. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't write what page it was on, but that's like it's it's the very end of the where of the part where it's there is a Grand Inquisitor story. Well, anyway, <coughs> so the two brothers are carrying a cross. Uh, you know, both. Well, I mean, not literally. But, uh, you know, that's so, so Dostoevsky represents. <coughs> and that is a symbol that both of them will have to go through suffering. And, and now we will be talking about, you know, the suffering and importance uh, of this spirit, suffering. Yeah. And why and what kinds of suffering is very important thing thing uh, in the book. So both brothers, it's clear even in you know in, in the beginning, both brothers will have to go through suffering. We talked about Dmitri just now, and we also mentioned that Zosima bowed down to Dmitri's suffering, indicating that whatever suffering he will be doing is the right kind of suffering. And I'll, I'll tell you that there can be a wrong kind of suffering. Uh, same way <coughs> we talked last time how both Dmitri and Ivan were close to committing suicide, but for very different reasons. You know, uh, same thing here. Both brothers are suffering, but with different kind of suffering. And whereas the one that Dmitri is going through is correct good beneficiary you would say and necessary you know to synthesize this contradictory uh, human soul the one that Ivan is going through is incorrect and actually you know bad and destructive for human soul that's why he will uh, need uh, as I said he will end up meeting and, and talking to the uh, devil himself <coughs> And another way to uh, to think about what Dostoevsky is doing here are two robbers uh, at the side of crucifixion, the, the one on the left and one on the right. Both of them were suffering there with Christ, and then, you know, the good thief was the first one in paradise because he experienced and the, the right kind of suffering, and the other thief you know, is being uh, condemned, and we know very little about him. So this is this is another thing that you know Dostoevsky takes the biblical story, and you know here it is in the book. The, the, the two th Pontius Pilate and his wife, or two. But I mean, those were two males. 
<laughs> and, and again, both brothers are carrying the crosses, you know, uh, fig figuratively. Yeah, that's Dostoevsky describing himself, because all three brothers is him. Dmitry, Ivan, and Alexei, it's a Dostoevsky. <laughs> Dmitry, Ivan, what he is, and Alexei, what he wanted to be. <laughs> That's that's another that's another thing, but I mean I took up the good tip just because we have a list, and on our uh, final meeting we'll go. I'll show you the list of all these uh, again sacraments or biblical references or things that Dostoevsky is trying to explain to us the existential meaning of all those things that we read in the Bible or do in the church. So here, this the good and the bad thief are people who go through the beneficial and salvific uh, suffering and all the others who suffer in vain and actually destroy themselves through that. <coughs> and again, uh, why Dostoevsky thinks that suffering is necessary for a person to be resurrected and to become happy? So he says, uh, like Alexei says to Kolya, you will suffer, but you will be happy nonetheless. And same thing Zosima said to Alexei. So Dostoevsky thinks that in order to be happy, not like, you know, in a, in a <coughs> television sense of the world, you know, happy, but to uh, in a Christian sense, to, to uh, live a happy life, fulfilling life, you know, life in Christ, Suffering is a necessary ingredient uh, in that. <coughs> because through the right kind of suffering, the human soul receives a chance to be resurrected and start loving others. That's what actually happens to Dmitry. And then the right kind of suffering actually even um, physically changes you. So if we go to the first page of this uh, book 11, on Ivan, we actually will read about Grushenka. She's the first one who we meet there. It's on page 563. Yes. And uh, right there, the first paragraph, this is what it says. Some three days after Mita's arrest, Grushenka had become quite ill and was sick for almost five weeks going through the suffering. For one of those five weeks, she lay unconscious. Her face was greatly changed. She had become thin and sullen. Though for, most, for almost two weeks, she had already been able to go out. But in Alyosha's opinion, her face had become even more attractive as it were, and he loved meeting her eyes when he entered her room. Something firm and aware seemed to have settled in her eyes. Some spiritual turnabout is being told in her. A certain steadfast, humble, but good and irrevocable resolution appeared. So here we have, again, through a physical appearance, he shows us the person, you know, after all those terrible things happened and Mita got arrested and you know they were separated and she was ill for five weeks one week unconscious you know she was but she was already prepared she was already infected with the uh, Christian li uh, love by Alexei before all of this happened so she comes out uh, out of the suffering even physically changed and you know, also in her eyes you know she's a different person but again Dostoevsky wouldn't be, you know, he's not this uh, kind of one-sided and rosy guy. And some lines, a few lines down, he says that nonetheless, every now and then, when she saw her rival, that, that other woman that was uh, Mitri's fiance, her old self would, you know, shine through her eyes. So, you know, he's really aware that it's not like boom, all of a sudden you are a different person completely. You know, this, the, this, the old her is still there. And it's not, you know, without practicing Christian life, without actually, you know, being aware, you know, it will take very little for her to go back to, uh, to who, she, who she was. And I think 
uh, yes J and to finish for today uh, that so that was the good kind of suffering the wrong kind of suffering on the other hand reinforces egoism is instead of re eradicating it and <coughs> yes I forgot to mention sorry one one important thing that the suffering for Dostoevsky is the cure for the original sin this is why we actually must go through suffering because this is what fights or you know eradicate or cures the original sin and the original sin for him it was shown in the uh, chapter on the mysterious visitor when uh, let me yes let, I'll let Father John read it and then we'll be uh, on our way okay I, in this book it's on page 303 What isolation, I asked him, that which is now reigning everywhere, especially in our age. But it is not all concluded yet. Its term has not come. For everyone now strives, most of all, to separate his person, wishing to experience the fullness of life within himself. And yet, what comes of all this, his efforts, is not the fullness of life, but full suicide. For instead of the fullness of self-definition, they fall into complete isolation. For all men in our age are separated into units. Each seeks seclusion in his own hole. Each withdraws from the other, hides himself and hides what he has, and ends up pushing himself away from people and pushing people away from himself. So he thinks basically this is what happened to uh, Adam, Adam and Eve, where all of a sudden he saw himself separate from the creation and not being just one with everything else. And that's why, you know, the fig leaf and everything else. I don't know, what do you think, Father John? No, I think that... Um it's an interesting island. Mm -hmm. a, de a definite, uh, definitely. I think that's true. I think that that's. I mean, you know, the, the basically pride, mm -hmm. and pride in vanity is what separates people from God. And initially, so the more further you go, the more further you fall into that hole of isolation and uh, isolationism. And that's why you know it's always been a struggle for Christians who want to. Um, you know, there are people that will live solitary lives, and they do that with blessing, and those are very few. But for most of us, we need a sense of belonging to something, a, a community of people. So I think that he's right in the sense that when we start down this root path of, of, uh, of sinfulness and uh, living uh, life for ourselves, that we basically fall into that hole. Yeah, and uh, you know, because the, the contrast in order to have this the Christian kind of love, the agape love, you need at least two people. So it immediately uh, goes against the isolation and egoism. You can never really claim to have a Christian love and be a separate unit. I mean, those solitary monks is a different thing but again they are not it's not like they start there you know they get there through after being experts in this but then when they do it they don't do it you know for themselves alone but for the benefit of you know as large a group of people as well, they, as serve. Mm -hmm. they serve I met a man uh, when I was in uh, Monathos about a, about a petty monastery and so I walked about 45 minutes into the woods into the countryside and there was a man who had built a ski and he had been living there since uh, 1960 and that was 2003 so quite a long time you might say and he was a priest and he basically had his little chapel and every and he was working you would thought that he, you would think that he had just had a full time job and so what did he do people sent him cassette tapes from all over Greece of pre-sermons that he would send them, he would package them up 
and send them out to everybody for their sort of like that they could listen to those sermons. And uh, he was totally dedicated to serving and to helping others. And here he was all by himself, but he wasn't really because he was gathered in Christ. And you could tell that. The kind of isolation that people like Smirnikov experience, or that is where you are by yourself, truly by yourself, and that's where those suicidal thoughts where it come, come into play with people is that they feel like life is just about them. So therefore, you know, that's the general idea. So, you know, the, the wrong kind of suffering will only reinforce the egoism instead of eradicating it and will lead to, you know, the fall of the human soul into the hands of the enemy of mankind. And this is, you know, to conclude, this is what Ivan will experience in this book and we will discuss it uh, next time and the devil will upload to him at the end it's on page 638 he was saying to Ivan oh it's noble it's so great that you will go to defend your brother tomorrow and you will sacrifice yourself saying that you know all this suffering you're going through this is the the kind of suffering that the devil wants you know doing the doing the noble <laughs> doing the noble thing but we'll talk about it more in details uh, next time, which might be the final one. We'll see how we move on. Maybe it will be two more. We'll see how you like <laughs> it. <laughs> I guess, uh, so for all, all of you who are gathered here, um, uh, before we have our final two classes, I just want you to know that classes will continue after that. <laughs> yes. It will not be on the Brothers Karamazov. But there will continue to be classes and instruction given on this Wednesday night. And uh, we'll try to make this, it, not, it won't be as much fun as Anatoly, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best to try to convey information and ways of learning. Anyway, it's uh, been, been a very excellent trek. And if you haven't read the book, I just going to say this, there, there's people here that haven't read the book. Uh, and may have been coming to classes regularly, but they haven't read the book. It's, it's kind of like uh, watching a movie of a book, uh, like The Lord of the Rings, but never having read Lord of the Rings. I mean, you can kind of get the general gist of things, but you won't get the deeper understanding. Thank God that we've had someone to explain it to us. But in reality, go back maybe after this class and read the book, because uh, if you haven't read it. Because I, I guarantee you that it's very transformative in a certain way. There, there, there are just few people who write, who actually write, that you yeah. could actually say, Dick, Charles Dickens is another one. You could read all Charles Dostoevsky's Dickens. Dostoevsky's favorite writer. Right. Oh, you could read all of Charles Dickens' rare books, and you would gain depth into the soul and comprehension of soul that you wouldn't get any other place, because he was kind of a theologian in his own way, like Dostoevsky. Yeah, they, he was. He did admire Charles Dickens, as he should. Charles Dickens was an incredible writer. There are other books, by the way, by the Dostoevsky. You know, that are not quite this big, but they're really good. Too. Okay. But this is the best thing. We're gonna rise. Break. Well, we're gonna paint. We're gonna, we're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna go to Jesus here because this is his day. Father John, are we going to have a break? At least one Wednesday. A break? We've had several breaks. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, uh, we want to continue, but uh, uh, Victor and I would like to go, and we are waiting for a long time now that this finishes, and then we are going to go to, you know, to Nectarius, to Father Nectarius. No, I don't. Uh, oh, it's in Yes, you know, St. Victorious hmm. that has its, uh, healing services on Wednesday evening. Well, you can go. It's, it's good. Yeah, but uh, we I'll need be a here. break. Well, maybe. We'll still talk about it. You can <laughs> take your own <laughs> private break. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anybody can take a break anytime they want. But anyway, uh, I do understand that. Christ is risen from the dead. Trampling down death by death, and on those who in the tombs bestowing life, Christos Vaskese is mertri, Smertius mert poprav, Iisusim pogrogek živo daroval, Christ is 
risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon the grim that Jews bestowing life. Christ is risen. In truth, he is risen. They keep on changing the word. <laughs> Words uh, like you know, those in the tombs or upon those in the tombs. All those in the tombs. You know, let me tell you, I'll tell you the origin. The origin is that in the Russian church abroad, uh -huh. which is the church that they kind of were raised in, uh -huh. they say, and on those. In the LCA, they say and upon. So all the music in the choir sings is and upon. Uh, okay. It seems like there's an extra note. Do you watch this new and tradition? And upon, the and that's it. I was raised by the syllable. I say and on those. What's it called? And then they're saying the words and then upon. So I think it changed over. I don't think it matters. On or upon. It's the same thing. 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 Нет, мы не можем перерыв будет после этого. Как? Лето, лето, я же поеду в Италию. All right, so I'll try to make it not the uh, final one. <laughs> I'll try to spread it over too, so that you can you can attend the final. But I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But I'll watch it on the way home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I mean, you'll need you'll need closure. You know, you've been uh, here all these twelve times, almost. You know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, because that would say, did you, know? you ever go to that church?